All right, so uh, in interest of time, I'm going to actually try to focus um, most of my efforts actually on the ADM slides because um, I've got 18 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I am not only a uh, child neurologist, but I'm also a parent of a special needs child. So for all of the parents out there, I every day besides being a researcher and a physician, I'm a parent, you know, and so I understand how this disease has affected your whole family. And one of the things I wanted to say just before I started just to follow up on what uh, Carlos said was that what I found as a parent is that the doctors, as far as their treatment, um, really for any sort of any sort of neurological disorder is only about 20% of your whole treatment of the child. So your IVIG, your plasmapheresis, et cetera, 80% are all the other people in your life, the therapist, uh, rehabilitation, 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 um, teachers and educate and, and slash educators. So just remember that your physician is part of a team of individ individuals uh, who, are going to, who are going to help your child or help the adult that uh, is in your family. Okay, let's see here if I can get, okay. So um, as I said, uh, I'm, because I'm short on time, I'm gonna s focus on ADM. ADM is a monophasic illness that mostly a pediatric disease. Some of it does, uh, as some of our families have seen, uh, does occur in adults, particularly in young adults, uh, particularly in the brain stem. Um, but it's mainly a pediatric disease, and so I'm gonna focus my efforts really on the pediatric population uh, and try to give you an idea as a child neurologist, how do I think about this disease in terms of, in terms of its diagnosis, in terms of its treatment. Now, uh, among all of my slides is an article that I think is very important for the clinicians who are in our audience. Um, much of the information that's in that, in that article, and I'll just uh, thumb through that, this was in pediatrics in 2004, is really uh, to understand how when a patient presents, particularly with their MRI findings, how do we sort out, in their clinical findings, how do we sort out uh, how a patient ends up with multiple sclerosis or a patient ends up with ADEM or a patient ends up with transverse myelitis in the pediatric population? Um, one of the main things is, of course, that the age of onset is quite different. And particularly, ADEM is actually in the youngest populations. Infections usually precede ADEM or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis more so than any of the other diseases, um, uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, you can also say the transverse myelitis in the pediatric population, also an infection precedes it as well. The MRI findings, there's a particular MRI finding for ADEM and we'll go over those when we talk about we talk about that. And the initial MRI for both ADEM as well as multiple sclerosis, the initial MRI is actually very predictive of actually the final diagnosis that a patient has, and that's the message from this slide. And the message from all of this uh, information that's listed on the distribution of the initial MRI findings. Uh, the spinal fluid is also uh, uh, predictive as well as to whether you have ADM or uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, inflammation is usually higher in ADEM. The protein is usually higher. And as well, um, part of the protein is that these uh, immunoglobulins, uh, what, are, um, what Dr. Bowen referred to as the production of these proteins from B cells, uh, is much more much more common in multiple sclerosis than it is in ADEM. Okay, I think I'll go through. I think I'll, I'll go on from this. And of course, we've heard a little bit about uh, transverse myelitis. I apologize; it wasn't Frank Pidock uh, at that this time, and instead it was Carlos. So, um, and anyways, uh, Frank actually has some previous talks that are actually out on the web on the 
mylattice.org website that one can uh, look at to look at the um, look at the Johns Hopkins pediatric transverse myelitis data. The data that I have in my slides um, is from an article um, that was published out of France in 2003. We know that it's rare. We know that this is an onset of spinal cord dysfunction in uh, both. Uh, on both sides of the body, but relatively asymmetric. The age of onset is a little older than it is in ADEM. And as we said, infections, uh, usually in the winter season or early, early spring, are usually the most common uh, presenting feature. We know that it's this sudden onset of, uh, sudden onset of motor function is uh, motor dysfunction or, or lack of function over 12 hours. Is, is really rare in terms of my life. There's more of a, more of a somewhat of a de gradual decline, usually over um, 24 to 48 hours, actually. And the one thing about kids uh, with their transverse myelitis that I'll point out is that they have a lot of pain. The younger they are, the more they have pain. In fact, some of them actually have what we call meningeal inflammation, meaning that they actually have inflammation in the covering of the brain itself. Um, I'll let you go through all these other abnormalities that are here in terms of detrin reflexes, weaknesses, um, dysfunction of the bladder, et cetera. The one thing to point out about um, pediatric transverse myelitis is that it's quite a bit of a misnomer. If you look on the pediatric MRI for TM, uh, it's actually, you see a these asymmetric white lesions or inflammations up and down the spinal cord. Uh, it's really not concentrated in any one particular re region. Uh, and that's pretty characteristic and a, and a little bit different from what you see in the adults. And of course, we've heard about the treatment, and of course we know about that and outcome, and I'll let you guys read that. An unfavorable outcome um, are things that are listed here, and things that are listed here. Time to maximum deficit, in, in my opinion, um, if it's less than 24 hours, seems to be kind of the, one of the predictive factors in the clinical course that uh, gets my attention uh, and tells me that I have to be more aggressive in terms of my treatment. Okay, and labor laboratory abnormalities, I'll let everybody just do it. Read. Okay, so let's go through ADM real quickly here, and I'm going to keep track of my time, guys, because I really want want you guys to get to the stem cell talk. Okay, so acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM is this inflammatory attack in uh, of the myelin inside of the brain. Okay, the myelin that's in the spinal cord is different from the myelin that's in the brain, and it's this very specific inflammatory attack of uh, the coverings of the nerves, uh, uh, the most common uh, thought in terms of the trigger is this uh, clearly infectious event. Uh, vaccines are less common in terms of what you hear in the history, but usually it precedes it by you know, one to four weeks and, uh, and about three-fourths of the pa patients. And there also can be a febrile uh, a fever associated with this as well and usually the onset is relatively younger. Um, the data that I'm uh, talking about is uh, derived from a, a very good article by Tenenbaum from 2002. And as I said, um, the, most, uh, the most common thing that you see is uh, in the history is this nonspecific URI symptoms or some sort of GI slash varicella slash slash other viral illness that's usually in the um, uh, history. The presenting signs of ADM are actually quite different from transverse myelitis. Transverse myelitis, you have an attack on, you have spinal cord signs, and, and you basically have a clear patient, uh, be it a child who's complaining of pain, but nonetheless, they seem to be themselves. They're in the right minds. Um, unfortun unfortunately, with ADM, that's not the case. Almost universally, it's a change in, you know, their, their, how they are, you know, a change in their sensorium. They're just, the child is just not themselves. Oftentimes, they do have, they do have weakness on one side, which is sort of similar to uh, TM. 
a, a lot of times they'll, they'll have a uh, unsteadiness. The doctor word for that is ataxia. And associated with that is actually something that's uh, a, a symptom that I uh, treat quite a bit, and that is seizures um, that you can see. So that's quite different from what you see in uh, T and TM. And this uh, involvement or pain that's in the neck, uh, inflammation of the coverings of the nerve, is quite extensive actually in ADM as well. Visual loss, loss of language, uh, and these, others, these other symptoms here are much less common. Now, as I said, the radiological findings um, that you see on ADM are, are, are quite different from the other diseases. It actually separates out into these four groups. And rather than try to go through all of these four groups, and it, the information is there for the clinicians in the audience, the main thing to uh, let you guys know is that the fact that there, is a, there are scattered lesions, basically, in the top of the brain as well as in, in, the, in the cortex or the outer part of the brain, as well as the underneath part of the brain or the supporting part of the brain called the spinal cord. It's much less common to, if you think about the brain as being a ball on a stick, it's much less common to have lesions in the, in the stick part or the brain stem, uh, but that does happen, and unfortunately, that can sometimes be a worse prognostic factor. Uh, the spinal cord, um, the spinal fluid uh, analysis, usually you have cells in there, usually you have proteins, um, and they mostly don't have these, in, these immunoglobulins uh, that are produced by B cells. The treatment of ADEM is actually um, is somewhat similar to pediatric TEM. We rely mostly on steroids, um, and uh, the doses the doses there. Um, we also do rely on uh, plasmapheresis and IVIG for treatment of this disorder as well, um, because they have other symptoms, including uh, viral components as well as seizures. There are some other medications that are used. The, the other thing about pediatric uh, ADM is that because of the involvement of the brain as well as um, possibly the brain stem, um, the patient often ends, ends up in the IC, ICU and in fact can require ventilation in a minority of cases. The outcome generally for ADM and the pediatric population is, is uniformly good for the most part. Now, there are some situations, uh, particularly when the lesions are more concentrated in the stick part of my analysis or the brain stem, where that the outcome can, uh, can, it can be much harder to treat and the outcome be uh, less well. And those are the patients for which you have to have multiple, uh, multiple treatments that you try, as well as, you know, if you, you're as a doctor, you, if you've, you've come to the end of the types of treatments that you can offer, you need to get them to specialists who can offer further uh, immu uh, immunological treatments. Overall, the residual deficits from ADM are um, relatively few. The most common of them, um, and I actually didn't even put this on the, sli uh, on the slide, is this um, mental handicap, and it's particularly uh, attention problems that they that they have. Occasionally, they'll uh, turn out with either some weakness of some sort. Uh, sometimes it can be severe if, if residual is there. And they can also have uh, epilepsy as well or recurrent seizures. Fortunately, ADM is a disease in which it's usually a monophasic neurological disorder, and it usually doesn't uh, reoccur. Um, there, is, uh, there is this report of this biphasic two episodes or multiple episodes of ADM. Um, in my experience, it's extremely, extremely uncommon. Um, the estimates of 2 to 10 percent in the literature, I think, are rather generous, to tell you the, to tell you the truth. Usually, if it does happen, it happen, you have one or two extra episodes. Um, and the interval between the episodes is usually about three years, pretty commonly. Um, 
And the other thing about that is that it actually is uh, very responsive to steroids and or IVIG once again. I think the point of the rest of my slides here, and I've got like three minutes. <laughs> the point of the rest of my slides is that um, there, are, there are other disorders that can produce weakness in changes in chains in sensory function um, that mimic uh, both transverse myelitis as, as, well as, um, as well as acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. One of them is this uh, in disorder that's called chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Um, we call it CIDP for short. And this is basically a chronic Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome is an, and this disorder is an attack actually against the myelin that's very specific for the uh, spinal nerves that go out to our muscles. And the thing about this disorder is that the children are, the children are usually older uh, when they have it. And it's usually a much more milder disease, um, uh, very, um, very, very responsive over here. Um, I'll go over here at, to treatment. Well, actually, I don't have treatment on here. Um, so, the, so the treatment of it is actually uh, very responsive to either steroids or IVIG. Um, and sometimes we'll bring kids every, in every month to get their IVIG. So. Um, I want to get to the, my last part of my talk here, and I just want to um, preview that. I've got one minute. Um, those, these last slides here talk, and I, I, what I wanted to give you a sense of is why did my child or why did the, uh, the adult in my family, why did they actually end up with demyelinating disease? And the answer with all of these, all, all of these slides here um, it is really uh, your genetics that the patient has. What makes up our DNA, okay? And it's our DNA that pr probably predisposes us uh, to actually getting these types of diseases. I have a bunch of uh, information that's on, on here that I won't go over. Um, it's for the clinicians there, but essentially, what I'm trying to say is that we're now entering the era of person, so-called personalized medicine. Uh, it, within probably 10 years, all of us in this room are gonna have our full DNA actually on a little credit card, okay? And your doctor is actually gonna be able to use that information in terms of not only diagnosing you, but very importantly, in, in your treatment of all of your different medical disorders. And there's a very, very active effort within the so-called genetic sciences or genome sciences uh, to try to make the, and try to bring the human genome project that sequenced the human genome to full circle. And so rather than go through all this information that's on here, I just wanted to uh, tell you guys that you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the future. I think Dr. Greenberg actually does have a talk somewhat on that in the future here. Um, this, this slide that I'll just end up with, these are uh, the slide, this is, are the locations in the mouse DNA of where this mimic of, of one of the neurological inflammatory disorders called uh, EAE, uh, and I won't, you shouldn't bother yourself with what that is, but basically the, the message from this slide is that there are many different places in the DNA that can predispose you to that, uh, that disease. And certainly we're going to see that, uh, we're going to be identifying that in the next 10 years. Uh, and I think Dr. Greenberg will talk a little bit about that uh, here at the meeting. You'll hear somewhat of that as well. Thank you very much.